Hello, and welcome back to the Argyle CFO Leadership Forum, FP&A Strategies for Success. My name is Michael with Argyle. A couple of notes before I turn things over to our panel moderator. To ask questions throughout the session, simply type into the Q&A chat, and we will address your questions at the end of the session. And now, without further delay, I would like to introduce our moderator, Philip Peck, Vice President, Advisory Services and Finance Transformation Practice with Peloton Consulting Group. We're excited to have Philip and our panelists with us for a panel discussion titled FP&A Automation for Enterprise-Wide Success. Philip, thank you so much for being here. Welcome and over to you. Michael, thank you so much. Greetings, everyone. I'm personally extremely excited to be moderating today's panel discussion as the topic is both highly relevant and extremely important for the FP&A and finance community. I have the honor and pleasure of facilitating to today's discussion with these three esteemed FP&A and finance subject matter experts. By way of background, as Michael said, I'm a Vice President of Advisory Services and Finance Transformation at Peloton Consulting Group. Our firm helps organizations deliver digital transformation initiatives with advisory, consulting, and managed services capabilities spanning business process improvement, technology implementation, data management, and organization change elements. Personally, I've spent my entire 35 plus career in the FP&A and finance arena, first on the corporate side and then on the consulting side, helping organizations explore the art of the possible by embracing leading practices to improve planning, forecasting, reporting analytics, resource allocation, strategy management, and overall decision-making capabilities. We'll now have these esteemed panelists introduce themselves. Christine, how about you go first, then Eric, then Val. Thank you, Philip. Um, my name is Christine Milloway. I am the CFO at Project Management Institute, PMI. I've been uh, with the organization for a little bit over six years. And prior to that, I spent about 20 years with uh, uh, manufacturing multi-billion for-profit organizations, held various different finance leaders, leadership roles. And I also spent four years in the strategy. So, uh, but FPNA has always been uh, dear to my heart. And I always think that is one of the most important functions in the any organizations. And as Philip say, I think talking about technology, finance technology is so relevant and so important. And I'm honored to be part of this panel discussion today and looking forward to this conversation. Christine, thank you. Eric, how about yourself? Oh, well, first off, thank you for, for welcoming me to this team. I'm re really, really excited to talk about FBNA. Uh, so by way of my background, I'm currently the Chief Financial Officer of the city of Quincy, Massachusetts, um, which is for Greater Boston. If you have any history buffs here, it's where John Adams and John Quincy Adams and John Hancock are from, so city bathed in history. Um, coming from the, I've worked my entire career in the public sector, and uh, my my, my background, uh, I'm an economist is my background before I became the CFO. Um, so a lot of what I've done over the last eight years in this role is modernize the ability for forecasting and planning and analysis um, and really try to create more machine learning around that. Uh, I'm an R coder, so if there's any R coders in the crowd, I'm one of the, the small groups that still likes to do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm kind of what our, my focus has been over my career is specifically in causal inference within the financial modeling. Um, understanding marginal effects and understanding how we can better optimize systems to act to really use that causal use this causal inference and this marginal impact analysis. Uh, so I'm very very excited to sit here and talk to talk with uh, you know this great panel and with uh, everybody in the audience today. Eric, thank you. Love love your background. By the way, that's it. It's fantastic, and this is going to be a, a fun mix across all of you. Val, how about yourself? Uh, so. Thank you for having me, right? So I'm uh, Valkir, uh, the Vice uh, President of Corporate Finance at Bahamar, $4 billion um, uh, property here in the Bahamas. Very nice. So if you guys want to visit us, just let me know. Um, being the, in the finance um, uh, world for the last 20 years of my career, uh, always in the hospitality industry. Um, so, you know, in many uh, different uh, positions, um, so I joined the Bahamar team to help them to um, streamline a lot of processes in finance. And uh, today I'm responsible for the finance transformation, um, implementing a lot of digital um, uh, ideas there. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. And again, the diversity of backgrounds, I think, is going to be great for our discussion. So let's let's go to the first discussion question. 
From your experience, how have you seen automation or technology improve the FP&A function? To the extent you have some real world examples, that would be great for you to share. Christine, we'll have you go first, then Eric, then Val. Happy to answer the question, but before I answer the questions, uh, Valkyrie, you know, I am going to visit you for sure. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> I already have the background. I already have the background. Uh, Perfect. Yeah. So um, it's a good question. So um, give you a little bit of background. My, the reason I joined PMI six and a half years ago was our company have decided to embark our digital transformation journey. So as the leader of finance, so it automatically one of our key priorities is to transform finance. So for a transformation, particularly for finance transformations, I would say there are three key pillars that we need to focus on. One is technology, second is the people, and the third is the processes. So technology is absolutely, absolutely critical for us to you know, have a really robust tra finance transformation. So what we've done uh, was we implemented ELP platform and we chose uh, Microsoft D365. Doesn't mean that's the best, but it fits our business need and meet our business requirement, right? And meanwhile, we also implement a, uh, a reporting to call solver. Some of you may know or may, may, you may be using it is for uh, reporting as well as uh, budgeting and forecasting tool as well. And the third one is then we also embrace using the dashboard reporting and so to provide visualization reports for the leadership team as well as to the board of directors. So um, let me talk about how each one of those and benefits, you know, and really create the value and improve the FP&A functions. So first one, I'm sure every one of us, you know, will, will agree that we still, uh, many of us and many of our FP&A teams still heavily using Excel, right? We create the Excel reports, and then when we have people on vacations or people turn over and then somebody come in and it's like, okay, this is not my Excel. I have to recreate my Excel report. So it's not a sustainable process. So having a reporting tools that allow us to create ad hoc reporting, but also have the um, routine, you know, the monthly quarterly reports is absolutely critical. And so it's substantially reducing the, uh, the amount of time and creating multiple different worksheets and also easy to share and distribute, uh, distribute, right? We can easily send it and just hit the button and send it to the entire organization. So that's one. The second one is during our implementation process, it also gave the team an opportunities to really reflect ourselves and say, hey, what are the really key business drivers that is truly linked to the financial performance? As a result, those are the important things that we wanted to measure and we wanted to keep track of. So going through the assessment and, um, and the planning process, really have the team to really think through the process and what are we doing? What are we trying to achieve and how is gonna to bring value to the organizations is a very important and valuable journey and experience as well. Um, the third one, last but not the least, when I talk about the Tableau, uh, the, the Tableau uh, dashboard reporting, for those of you who has uh, used Tableau, actually it's a very user-friendly, easy to use, relatively easy to create, um, report, but it provides that visualizations and to the leadership team and the board of directors. And particularly, the board was very, very appreciative of, you know, the, when we introduced this dashboard reporting, because they say that when I'm traveling, sitting on the plane, when I'm sitting on the train, and I can just even be able to look at my phone uh, because it's mobile friendly and be able to say, okay, let's see what's the financial metrics, you know, this, this week was, was the, some of the operational metrics and fp &A was able to create those dashboard and really valuable information and insights for the leadership team as well as to the board. And is really enhanced and escalate, you know, the value of fp &A functions that we're not just reporting, but we truly be things through as a thoughtful process and creating very, very important and useful dashboard 
to make an important decisions. So I, I think those are some of the things that from my experience that having the technology um, and the automation uh, tools is so important to really enhance the functions of FPNA. Christine, wow. <laughs> you really set the stage, I think, for all of us. That's a what a transformation journey. The, the pillars as you laid them out, the technology, the processes, the people, the uh, raising the bar, such as you're focusing on the critical few elements that drive business performance. That's powerful. That's really powerful. Uh, let's keep going here. Eric, how about yourself for that well, question? I, I'm certainly not going to try and uh, uh, it's going to be hard to follow up on that, but I would, I would like to kind of extend some of the stuff that uh, Christine talked about, particularly within, within my chair. Um, and he, Christine used a really, really apt word there, which was a journey. I really think that's what FPNA is. Uh, mm -hmm. No matter how automated we make it within the, within a large organization, especially like in a city, which I know I'm probably a little bit of a rarity in some of these discussions. But we have we're a conglomerate. We have 34 different departments that all have different um, skill levels, but all need data. And I often I often talk about before I was in this role, CFO, as the chief analyst. So I often talk about FPNA as a gradient. Analytics is a gradient. The, from Excel VBA to some of the most high-powered status systems or even our systems, uh, it's a gradient. And anytime you can get somebody onto that, onto that process, no matter what their background is, there's huge value gains. There's massive value gains. FP&A is not just meant for the people with very specific mathematical and STEM backgrounds. It's not meant just for the econometrics. It's meant for everybody. The best thing we can do as FPNA innovators, no matter where you are, public, private, local, nonprofit, whatever have you, is be a channel, to be a translator for all this great data. What the automation, the automation of FPNA helps us with is we can now automate that translation. And we need to become stewards of that automation process and ensure that the data collecting is good, the data extending is good. Um, well, I, I'm like, uh, you know, similar, I should say, actually, to a lot of people in the private sector. I do have effectively a board of directors. I have a, you know, we have a city council that we have to report data to. That comes from an eclectic background. And that's what makes local government great, is that you have many different perspectives voting on important decisions. Um, so what I have to be able to do is, similar to with board of directors, is how can I present this data that can be observed from different sides and still give meaningful information? Um, I often joke, I don't have one boss, I have six, the city of Quincy is 106,000 people. I have 106,000 constituents um, and they need to be able to understand this information. And similar to the gradients we see within organizations, that exists in the, in the population. And people are entitled to, to having this information. They are 100% of every right in the world to be able to understand our financial information. They should understand it. And part of any good suite of financials is FPNA. I would argue, I'm really biased, obviously, given the topic of this of this conversation, that FPNA is crucial for that. So when we talk about that, you know, the autom the automation and technology improvements we've seen so far, and how we can improve those, to me, it's all about lowering barriers. Lowering. Listen, would I love to have a really lengthy discussion on probit modeling or nonlinear modeling? Absolutely. Ask my wife. I don't shut up about that stuff. Um, but we need to bring down those barriers. We need to tell people why. Why this information is important. And they need to do it in a way where we bring them to understand why it's important. We're not just telling them why it's important. So when I look at that, um, that ombre, I'll say, that, 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 that gradient, that painting of application, it's about making sure that our systems are automated in a way that everybody from the newly hired intern to the CEO is gaining the most value they can out of the system. Uh, well, well stated. And listening to you, uh, Eric, there's an element there where I'm hearing loud and clear, you and your organization are helping to raise the competency level and literacy of everyone who's consuming the data, the information, the insights, the analysis, such that all of them can do whatever their role is. As you said, ultimately 106,000 or whatever the number of bosses you have, you're, you're raising the bar. I mean, tools and technology help you get there. Yeah, absolutely. Val, how about yourself? Um, just add, uh, but for example, what, what I constantly say here around the resort, right? Because uh, working in hospitality, you always have these different uh, system departments. You have from, uh, you know, finance department to events and then uh, reservations, reception. It's a, it's a very complex environment. So 
there's a lot of operational um, um, you know, associates. Um, they, they always have this um, you know, kind of fear about finance. But in the end, I always tell them finance is just you know, operations in numbers. So a server see a can of Coke, we see that in numbers. So when they make that, um, that association, right? So the numbers start to make sense for them, right? Because one of the most challenging things nowadays is to uh, present precise and fast information. Uh, that combination is very, very interesting, right? So um, to, to make the, 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 the speed um, uh, to what, what is needed today, you really need to think about automating processes, right? So here in the Bahamas, we started with uh, this, um, with this consolidating all these different sources of information in one uh, unique place. So we can start to provide all these uh, outputs, all these different uh, dashboards and things like that. It's very challenging when you have a very complex environment with different systems. Uh, but in the end, uh, you know, instead of you trying to connect all these different sources to a unique place, uh, we came to this idea to, you know, export all these different uh, important the reports from all these different sources to a specific place where we can start to build all these beautiful uh, visualizations, dashboards, and things like that. Uh, always in mind to have precise and speed information. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that's great. And I like I like the theme that you highlighted at the outset of your statements was helping those, as you said, uh, Finance is really the translation of operationally what's happening. That can of Coke translates into numbers and it could be the event. It could be uh, the, the stay at the particular property, whatever it is, you're helping that operational world be translated into finance such that everyone can understand. Right. Let's go on to our next question then. Uh, this is a little more specific around automation. What specific tasks are most important to automate first and why? Eric, we'll start with you, then head over to Val, and then let Christine respond. Absolutely. Um, I prefer to follow um, the ATM model, I call it, the, the automatic teller machine. Um, you automate the simplest tasks. Um, you know, there's this old adage that, like, technology steals jobs. Chat GPT is going to steal your job. ATMs are going to steal jobs. Uh, no, they're not. There's more bank tellers working in the United States now than when the ATM was first designed, was first implemented. Um, ATMs, auto, anything automatic, makes good workers better, all right? It automates and frees up your high-value talent to do more high-value talent things, not just changing money left and right. Um, so I always advocate, automate the easiest parts. So with my ERP system, what we, gain, what we look to automate is anything that an API can stop requiring somebody to do a data push and data pull, automate that first. Is it great to automate, you know, an RDD or synthetic control or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. That'd be great if you just have an automatic regression continuity design model pumped out. But you don't use it that often. What you do use is data pushes and data pulls. And it also benefits the biggest user base. The biggest data pull, data push, those aren't complicated tasks, especially with the level of talent that we see coming into the workforce that's just been doing this forever. Um, they never have a memory of not doing data pushes and data pulls, if you can automate that, that talent is gonna have more time to develop their skills. They're gonna have more time to work in actionable decision-making. Uh, so I always say automate the easiest stuff first. It's not as fun, it's not as flashy, but it's the best return on value. And then you can work up to having, you know, automatic GIS generating databases and stuff like that. That's the fun stuff. I mean, absolutely nerdy, fun stuff, absolutely. Uh, but if your organization uh, is still doing data pushes and data pulls, you got to work on that before you can really start using the fancy FP&A stuff, having that automated. That's, in my opinion, that's just my opinion, but uh, start with the low-hanging fruit. No, that's a great perspective. And that listening to you, Eric, there's an element uh, of almost a maturity evolution. So what you're describing is the foundational elements, get them in place, do it right, such that over time you can do more of the... Uh, scintillating, exciting, sexy, however you want to characterize it, but you have to have the building blocks in place first. Absolutely. Val, would love you to comment on where, where would you start with automation? So, you know, uh, working again in the hospitality, it's all about convincing all these different departments to buy in, right? And then because of this fear about the technology taking over your jobs, 
right? The, the, the most important thing from us, from finance, is to show, right, is not about cutting heads, right? It's not about the head count. It's about really making uh, impactful decisions so operations can uh, work uh, better. So on that, I would recommend you to go around in your property, right, in your company and talk to your people to see what would be the best uh, thing to automate and then try to give to them uh, some type of decision um, uh, opportunity there, right? An opportunity to make a decision uh, for what could uh, help them uh, to be better. Because if you make that approach, instead of going from top to bottom, uh, that changed a little bit the perspective. So I would say, yes, start with the, the cheapest ones, right? The simple tasks, but allow the team to give you those, those ideas. That is key and for sure will make you successful in your journey. Now, that's, that's really interesting. A term jumps into my mind, which we've all heard in different contexts, but almost that element of crowdsourcing. So you're you're going out to the stakeholders and by virtue of just reaching out to them, you're starting the process of adoption, of change management, of buy-in, of helping them go, wait a minute, I get to be part of the solution. That's really, really powerful. I, right. I love that perspective. Christine, where would where would you start on automation? Yeah, I, I like I like the quote that you know Beauval and Eric talk about automation makes workers better, right? So um, in, in my organization, I would love to have those repetitive and transactional types activities uh, like, you know, account reconciliations, band reconciliations, you know, or processing simply vendor, you know, processing invoice. Those I call that more routine and more mundane types of activities to be automated because it's the same reason that Val and Eric talk about is so that we can truly be able to make room for our staffs and employees to do more, um, I call the judgment-based activities, right? And also more the analytical thinking types of activities and rather worry about the debit and, and, and credit. So I think it's this, I fully agree with what Val and Eric talk about. It's really truly, how do we want to use the, the best, better use of our um, human uh, interventions or human, you know, work rather than, you know, be able to utilize machines and uh, AI to help us to do those, you know, um, repetitive and routine and transaction work. No, that, that's great. That's great. I, th I think you've distilled that and summarized that really well, Christine. So the, those common, those common themes, you're coming at it with slightly different lenses, but you're kind of landing in that same place around uh, where do you start? How do you start? How do you engage the organization such that you can continue to improve, free up time to do more value-added activities, which we all love, but also helping people uh, through that journey as they internalize the importance of everything we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, next question. How can implementing the right tools or technologies increase productivity and strengthen the overall business? I think we've touched on elements here, but I think just coming back here and letting uh, all of you opine and you know add some color commentary would be good. Val, start with you, then move to Christine, then move on to Eric. Sure. So the first thing that I want to make uh, the audience very audience very clear, it's about this automation uh, journey. It's not about cutting uh, or saving on uh, on headcount. It's not about terminating people. It's about opportunity. So here are a piece of information for you guys, right? Um, IBM, right, in 2016, did like an analysis about bad data in the market. So imagine, imagine this number, $3.1 trillion from the US economy, right, from the GDP stripped out because of bad data. Mm -hmm. Look how crazy is this? Right, the opportunity is not on savings or uh, heads, right, or or cutting in personnel. The, the, there is not the opportunity. Automation is being attached to that, and we need to, you know, strip this concept out of it. Okay, so you need to all automate your your processes, right, so you can uh, get inside the guts of your organization, of your company, right. Uh, Sometimes you lose money and you don't even know from where you are losing money. You don't know the root causes of it, right? Uh, so 
automation helps you to shed light on this, on these type of things. So you can uh, start to, to, to get a different approach there. So a couple of questions for the audience as well, right? So we can start to think about this. So imagine, imagine this, how many decisions, right? You are not making today because you don't have the correct information. So think about that, right? Why I keep explaining things, what happened, right? To bad results, right? Uh, that you didn't even know that was happening or the, the, at the moment. So it's just lost opportunities. So imagine this. Imagine if you could see your most relevant de data live, right? Don't you think that, that that could help you, right? Imagine that moment, a cancellation fee that had just happened, a group that just canceled something, a contract that just went down. At the moment that you know that, you can make, make action instead of just explaining things a month later. Right? Why keep explaining? Right? Forget about time saving. This is not about it. Automation is not about time saving. It's about increasing productivity. We have on the table, right? And uh, you know, the fastest ones is gonna buy those numbers, right? Three point one trillion dollars loss in the U.S. economy because of bad data. Automation is what is gonna help us um, um, to bite on that uh, on that pie. I, I appreciate having the, and I think all of us, especially the participants, appreciate uh, Val, you're putting context around the automation and also linking it to macro perspectives on if you don't have it, what are you missing? So spin it into the positive, the opportunities lost. If you don't have the data, it's not high quality data, you don't have the time to do the analysis and add insights. I think that, that really puts it, puts it into perspective. Yeah. Christine, what are, what are your thoughts on this? What you just said, well, remind me of this quote, data is king, right? We all, we all know it. Data is king. It's all about data, data, data. And all this Facebook, all this Google company, you know, they collect a, such a tremendous amount of data, useful data, and, you know, to be able to improve. Um, I want to go a little bit slightly different directions uh, to answer your question, Phil. Um, Great. Having the uh, automation, having the tools is important. I think is we also need to uh, be mindful about what tools to select, right? I mentioned about in, in our organization, we chose to use Microsoft D365. Doesn't mean it's the best tool in the world. My prior company, we use SAP. So it really depends on, it's so important to really understand um, what's your business model What's your business requirement? And what do you try to get out of this tools and automation process at the end of the day? And then to, to have all these elements to before you choose your tools. So give you an example. Uh, at my current company, PMI, we are majority, we are B2C business, meaning we are business to consumer business versus in my previous experience, we are B2B business. So for a B2C business, and some of you are very well aware, having the customer journey, the engagement uh, journey is so important. So we need to be able to keep track of our customer engagement from front to end. So including the ERP solution, including you know, the dashboard to be able to understand why the customer do what they do with us, right? And so as a result, those are important business requirement and business model that unique for our business that we get into a business requirement. So we talk to multiple different vendors and truly be, understand what do we need to get out of it and how do we set up the system to get us those useful um, automation information, so to speak. So I just want to call that out that is just selecting the right tools it's just as important to just say, let's, let's do automations. Yeah. That's a very, very important point, uh, Christine. You're highlighting, one, the industry-specific aspects and your value chain, that's the anchoring point about how all of us in FP&A and finance and even broadly think about how we add value. You have to understand that. That's so foundational. Mm -hmm. To your point then, the term that I've heard in the past, fit to purpose, yes. define those requirements, align it to your needs. As for you, customers, 
centricity is so important. So your tools, your technology, your automation is fit to purpose. Is exactly. the way I think is a good way to characterize it. Yeah. Eric, what what about yourself here? Yeah, I, I think the other panelists did a fantastic job covering a lot of this. But uh, kind of what I want to talk, kind of what things I want to focus on is the kind of that terminology, the scan for new new solutions. Um, one of the things I think that sometimes we fall into um, an issue in the FP&A world, maybe just in the data analytics world, or sometimes honestly just in the finance world. Um, we look for solutions that don't have problems. Um, sometimes I've seen FP&A over applied, um, it's, which is great. I mean, I'm, I love math for math's sake, but sometimes an Excel sheet is actually the best outcome. Uh, sometimes VBA is the right solution in Excel. Sometimes your ERP standard report is the best solution. Um, I, I think there's um, that don't over engineer it kind of inquiry. It, it, our position is kind of the best to take in some of these. Um, so the way I tend to tend to look at it is that if a new problem arises, um, the first step is can it be addressed with our current FP&A system? Um, can it, and then if the answer is yes, can it be automated? If that answer is yes, then you kind of stop looking. As we, as we, we only have so many hours in the day. But I think if that that second question is no, or that first even worse, the first question is no. Um, you know, your FP&A system is missing something. There's a blind spot. I think it's our job. Um, to advocate for an FP&A solution for that blind spot. Um, we should be looking for solutions that improve the system as a whole, but aren't just exercises in how much we can use FP&A. Uh, mm -hmm. So again, I don't really have a long answer to that because I mean, the other panelists covered it way better than I'd ever be able to, but um, I guess I'll be a little bit negative dose there saying, you know, sometimes the solution is just the simplest solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, to, to your point, Eric, uh, a colleague of mine who I worked with a long time ago, he had a very, very unique personality, but what he brought to bear was looking at things slightly differently than most other human beings did. And we would sit in working sessions with our clients, you know, understanding the current state landscape. Wow, the pain points, the tyranny of Excel spreadsheets, the lack of access to data. And then you try to eventually start solutioning. And he would say, Philip, the last thing we want to do is advocate a nuclear powered mousetrap. If the Occam's razor, sometimes the simplest, you know, simple when you think about the problem, when you think about the opportunity, to your point, hey, wait a minute, we already have a system. It may not be 100% perfect, but oh, with some minor configuration, we can accommodate what we need. Check. Mm -hmm. Oh, is there an opportunity to automate? So that you, yeah, the nth, the 99th, whatever percentile is not always the best path forward. Uh, and it often, it is, it's not. No, yeah, it's funny. Uh, a common phrase that uh, the people in my office hear me say is don't use a nuclear bomb or a hand grenade, it's fine. Kind of mind, reminds me of an old Monty Python episode. I'll show my age when I used to watch things like that. <laughs> a couple couple questions have come up, and it's uh, Mary's in with one of the questions that we were going to tee up anyway. And we've started a bit here, and Val, I know you helped us a little bit on this journey. The question is, how can you address reluctance to change from employees, especially if there's concerns around automation, whether that's taking over manual tasks or taking away things that were you know near and dear to my heart? So I think. Uh, weaved in with some of the questions there's i think participants are going wow gosh this sounds good but we have teams we have people maybe that have been in their roles for a while or conversely we have new people i think eric you highlighted this that the skills the aptitude it's vastly different certainly than when when i came into the working world and their expectations are different so maybe uh have all of you speak a bit to that how do we address change management? How do we address the reluctant reluctance? How do we bring people along? Mm -hmm. And maybe uh, Christine, start with you, then go to Eric, and then to Val. This is a great question, Phil. It's a it's a great question because I think it's fair to say we all, as finance leader, have we received the reluctance from from the team members, right? So I think from my experience, I would group that as three different bucket of resistance or the big reason. I'm sure there's many, many different reasons, but in my head, there's three different groups. The first one is you talk, you said it, Phil, is the change management. Change is not easy, right? Change is not easy. We all went through COVID in the last few years. And when all of a sudden, when this 
we have to change the way we work. We have to do things differently and it's scary. And some people will find that very unsettling and, you know, uncertain, you know, why are we changing? We've been doing all this manual process that, you know, is, is working. I work 80 hours a week, but it works. So what if we change that I may have to triple check and double check and all these things, why do we change? So that's one component and I'll address, you know, how do we address it a little bit? The second big bucket is the data, right? Val, you, you said it very, very rightfully. So data is so important. And so people will be like, well, you know, it's not gonna be right anyway. Uh, if you do automation, then I have to confirm, I have to do this and that and see, okay, how can I trust the data? I don't trust this data, right? So, but that's another issue. The third one is, you know, is the dear to their heart, what about my job, right? How is going to impact my job, which is a, we all human being, it's a very, very reasonable question. So if I may spend a couple of minutes on each one of this you know, big buckets of the questions and reluctance reason. The first one is change management. Without the team, without the buy-in, nothing will be successful. We can have all the vision that we wanted to have and it won't be able to execute correctly. So change management is absolutely critical. It's a culture change, it's a mindset shift to really be able to explain, communicate and articulate why are we doing this at all? Why are we spending money? Why are you spending time? Because it does take time. It takes time to set it up. It takes time to design, to assess, and it is an ongoing maintenance as well. So why are we doing this? So truly be asking all those questions ourselves and be able to really explain and communicate to the team because it will create a lot of benefits that Val and Eric talk about, you know, that we can use the time to do value at the work and we'll have the, the job more fulfilling, you know, more purposeful, more meaningful work, right? And, but also if we can help the company to have the competitive advantage because we have more quicker, right? Val and Eric, you talk about to have the accurate and also speedy information readily available for the organization is so critical. And, and then I mentioned about customers. Customers also want data. They want to understand, you know, um, how's my learning journey with, with you, PMI. So all those values need to be articulated very carefully and, and make sure it's understood by our staffs and employees. The second one, talk about the data. And we can talk about data all day. But the key thing is bad data come in, bad data come out. Right. So whether we do automation or not, we need to have a good data governance process, understand who is the data owner. We need to have a data lineage, meaning we understand the data mapping journey end to end. So we know what data we are providing and how do we ensure is accurate. So we have to do that anyway. So I think the automation will give us the opportunity to really look into set up those data governance process and make sure the data is right and useful. And the last but not the least actually is the most important is what about me? And I think Val and Eric, you touch on that already. Um, I think there's definitely recent studies talk about particularly younger people, you know, not like older people like us, but even older people would say benefits is important. Money is important. But to do meaningful work is the most that I'm going after. With this very, very difficult uh, labor markets that are not easy to get talent, we need to help our team to really provide them the meaningful work so that they get come in and excited to do the work. They're not like, oh, just doing debit, balance, debit credit, just to do, just to confirm the balance is right, right? So to provide that, um, that visions and that motivation is so important. Not only we will remove the obstacles of the reluctance, but we'll get them excited. We'll get them motivated and say, hey, you are the driving force to making change for the organizations. And your job is going to be a lot more meaningful, a lot more fulfilling. It's, it's going to be fantastic. I'm just excited just talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Christine, suffice to say, you're very <laughs> passionate about this topic. And I think uh, everything that you said, not just powerful, 
But I think all of us listening are like, wow, you've really captured and characterized this um, in a very distinct, clear, and impactful way. So thank you. Thank Eric, you. Uh, any any follow-on thoughts? It's a it's a tough, yeah. tough thing to follow on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I just kind of want to hit on, the, on uh, kind of the way to get reluctancy. Uh, I work in government. I work in local government. Um, we're kind of like the poster child for reluctancy, if there's ever been one. Yeah, um, you know, the city worker mentality. Um, and, you know, we've gone through a lot of ERP updates fairly recently. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, ERP is the baby step to FP&A. I think we all know that. Um, it's, it's where the data comes from. Um, and one thing I've noticed is that, you know, you have people who've done the same job for 30 years and their core members, like the, the offices don't function without them. They're incredibly important to no matter what department they're in. Yet they have this visceral reaction to change, um, especially change that they feel like is maybe a generation ahead of them or maybe, you know, not they're not really computer people. And one thing I always tell them, I go, do you know what the hardest day of any new system is? The first day it gets progressively easier. I I'll always tell them like, um, you know, especially people who have been here a while, I go, do you start this job with a smartphone? No, right? Do you like using your smartphone? Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. Do you remember learning a smartphone? It really stuck, didn't it? Yeah, but now if I took your smartphone away from you, would you, you wouldn't be happy with me. Or even um, one of my favorite things is that we still have people who like to use tape machines, like the calculators that print out on the top. I'm just like, why are you not using Excel? Like you, you I got, we have people who like will rip off the tape and staple it to stuff. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna show you how to use Excel. I'm like, oh, this is so much easier because when I make an error, I can actually go in, in there and just change that one cell. And I remember being in second grade when I first used Excel and they were like, you know, teaching us that in computer class, we'd have to type how many pizzas each classroom ordered on pizza day. That was like our first um, class <laughs> we ever did with it. And uh, so to me, it's just like second nature. You use Excel for everything. Um, so what I found is that breaking down that wall of saying like, this is going to improve your job. There's not taking your job. It's here to improve it. You can really work mm -hmm. down the reluctance. And that has to be a hand-on approach by us. That can't be something that we outsource. Um, the FP&A, especially people guiding the FP&A for your organization should be involved in this. I know that sounds crazy. Um, you know, the city of Quincy, we have 1,300 employees. Um, and we have about 250 that are in the financial arm or deal with money, deal with our ERP. If you can take the person who struggles most, who you know can be the most reluctant, and get them on board, you'll be mm -hmm. shocked how quickly everybody else follows that. Mm -hmm. um, but the, it's key to reassure that this is making their job easier and acknowledge that they're reluctant. Don't just pretend like, oh, well, maybe it's this issue. No, they're just reluctant. People are, you know, mm -hmm. they, they need some inertia. Um, so, yeah, I'd say, you know, just Christine covered this much more, very, very thoroughly. Uh, but it's address the reluctancy, hit it head on. Because if you get one person to, to accept it, it's probably going to spread to the rest of the department once they see how much easier that person's job is now. Mm -hmm. You're you're bringing bringing to life in a very powerful way, Eric. Mm -hmm. uh, we're human beings. We have emotions. We have elements that are seemingly unique to us. Find a common ground with all of them and validate their feelings. Show some yes. empathy. Be, so I, I love where you're going. You call it emotional intelligence or call it whatever. For, for you and for us, in large part, it's common sense. This is a way you help people through the journey. And once you get a couple of victories, boy, sprinkle the infield, spread it around as fast as you can and get them get them to start doing the high fives with everyone else and going, did you know what you can do? I mean, that, that that's, that's pretty cool. Val, uh, before we go to the last question, you want to offer any other yeah, thoughts here? Really quick, three things. First one, data is information right? AI and RPAs are tools. Yes. But they don't make decisions. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's always a human element there that needs to make the right call, that needs to see and act. And that, as far as I know, uh, will not be replaced. Um, so focus on that. Forget about how much money you can save. Again, uh, and cutting heads, right? And in a saving in payroll. That not, that's not the approach. $3.1 trillion, trillion, dollars, trillion dollars are being left on the table. So there's plenty of money for us you know, to focus on opportunities and not on just savings. 
Great, great. All right, so we have five minutes, and I'll I'll personally say I would love to continue speaking all day, but I know we're we're part of a larger program here, so we'll we'll wrap it up with having the three of you lean into the future, look across the horizon, put on your your prognostication hat, and you know, like like you're in the uh, having your eye exam, and they ask you to do the chart, and it's increasingly gray and ambiguous, but we'll ask anyway. And Val, I'll start with you. Uh, can you make any predictions as to what the future of FPNA will look like, say, this year, but yeah. probably more importantly, beyond, out on yeah. the horizon? What would be your so your instead of making predictions, I'm going to come meet here with the with everybody from finance, right? My my commitment, right, in this uh, role that I take very 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 serious, is to take away that mentality of cost savings and focus on opportunity, right? We need to stop talking about what is the ROI on uh, implementing automation? Forget about that, right? Focus on how many opportunities are, you are missing because you, the data is not in front of you. Mm -hmm. So that's not a prediction. That's what I'm going to do to make sure that we succeed. Wow. Love it. Love it. That's a mantra that we should, we should, all, we should all live. Eric, your thoughts? Yeah. I, that's awesome. I don't want to fall back. And I just, I just copied what they said. Um, no, the, uh, no, so to, uh, to, to predict it, I guess the way I would say is um, I think there's two things you're going to see. Democratization of FPNA is going to become more easier to access by more and more people. Mm -hmm. I think what we're looking at now is not Excel to a coding language. We're looking at Lotus to Excel or spreadsheets to Lotus to Excel. I think we are really, really far in front of it. And I think we're going to see these incredibly dramatic cut downs that are going to get more usable for people. Uh, and the other thing is I think we're going to see UX explode. I think we're going to see the user experience, the, how the average worker can engage in this go through the roof. I think dashboards can become even more intuitive, more, more depth and easier access. Um, I, I, I kind of put it this way. I'm, I, like I said earlier, my background's a lot about a lot of different causal inference. And I look at something like synthetic control, which is such an advanced form of modeling, we don't even have hypothesis testing for it. And even seeing that now it's starting to bleed into FPNA when I'm like, wow, I would have never thought you know, five years ago that synthetic control would ever have an application in finance. Did you make the right decision? Is usually not a question we ask ourselves in FPNA mm -hmm. in a proactive nature. Um, and seeing that, we go, wow, if you can start using an applicable side of synthetic control in FPNA, we're on the cusp. This is eventually going to be something where everybody's using it from somebody sitting at, the, at a clerk's window all the way up to the CFO chair is going to be working with the same ecosystem. And we should strive to build our FPNA systems now knowing that ecosystem's coming. Wow. Well, I love the, I love the uh, out there on the horizon, like uh, the old TV show, The Outer Limits. But uh, to your point, it's increasingly closer to us, and it will like, impact of all of us in a, in a very positive way. Christine, if you want to wrap up with a couple quick comments before we, like two minutes here. Sure, it's a, a powerful, you know, closing statement from, from both of you, Eric and Val. So I don't have the crystal ball, but I wanted to share this um, recent articles that are uh, published by Gartner. Now, they didn't predict, this is not their prediction, but they said that, you, you know, how Gartner worked with multiple industries, multiple CFO. And so they said that these are the strategic assumptions. And I, I would like to share a couple of them with the audience. By 2028, 50% of the organization will replace bottoms-up detail forecasts with AI. By 2027, 90% of the descriptive and diagnostic analytics in finance will be fully automated. So the reason I want to share this with you, I think it's fair to say in the next few years, I think the definitely there will be an upward trend, right, in having more advanced analytics and have more automations in finance to truly help us to be able to make a better decisions. And so I think the investment will increase. And uh, we, I know we're not talking about return on investment, but I think the opportunities is there. So now is the time to make sure that we are not falling behind. It's important to invest in this important area. Christine, thank you. I think that's a perfect wrapper. Uh, so before I hand it to Michael, I want to wholeheartedly thank all of you, Christine, you, Eric, and Val. I know I have personally learned a tremendous amount in this discussion. I'm assuming that the participants uh, equally benefited from all of your insights, perspective, and just 
gems. I, I have a number of gems floating in my head that I'm going to take some notes on. So thank you so much. And thanks, participants, for uh, being here on the webinar. Michael, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Philip, Val, Eric, and Christine, for such an insightful panel discussion. I also want to thank everyone else for joining us today. Now, this session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand following the event. Philip and panel, thank you so much.